Thank you very much. It's great to see such a good turnout uh, for the food chemistry talk today. Um, as is just mentioned, my background has been in food for quite a long time. Um, my formal training has been in food chemistry. I've loved every moment I've had within the, the food area, both studying from a research point of view and from the industrial point of view. So hopefully today you'll get a little bit of taste as to chemistry, the role of chemistry and its impact on all of the foods that we eat. Okay, so in terms of what we're going to, to do today is first of all looking at why do we choose the foods that we choose? Why do we like some foods and don't uh, like other foods? And an awful lot of it, not exclusively, but a lot of it has to do with the sensory properties of food. So that's what we're going to look at today. And by sensory properties, we mean how does the food look? How does it taste? What's the texture like? So today we're just going to go through some of the chemistry that underpins the whole sensory aspect of uh, food products. And hopefully you'll have some appreciation that chemistry has a very big role in making foods either tasty, nice, not nice. Okay, so first of all, the foods that we, we like to eat. Okay, normally there are foods that tend to have a high sugar content and normally we tend to like foods that have quite a bit of fat on them as well. We like the creamy textures, we like sweet tastes. And then there are foods I don't think that you would be interested in, for example, eating these products. We know straight away by looking at them that we don't like this, we're not going to eat this. And part of this is from evolutionary protection, that we know we don't want to eat something that's going to make us sick, or that if something's bitter, it may be poisonous. Smell is very important, okay? Fresh fish doesn't have a smell, but very quickly, uh, fish develops off flavors and smells and it can be quite off-putting to, to people as a result So smell is important And then it may not be just the food. Okay, so this is an example of regular chips uh, To the left hand side and then chips that are a bit burnt Okay, so you won't be as excited to eat the burnt chips In fact, you probably won't even eat them and that's just simply a color element okay it's going to be the same chip it's going to be the same oil they've just been cooked a little bit too long <coughs> so you could would have looked at those pictures and you would have known straight away i'd like to eat that i don't want to eat that and what influences that food choice what makes you like it or dislike it as i say there are a, a number of factors and the first really is your, your family environment, okay? So the foods that you've got used to as you were growing up, what you were exposed to as a younger child is going to influence your, your preferences. There may be a religious aspect to it. You may not eat meat, you may not eat certain meats. And then your stage of life, okay? Our, our interests in things as we progress through life changes, and it's, it's similar for foods. Foods that you might want when you're younger may not be particularly the, the foods that you want when you're older. And lots of things change on e ageing, particularly our ability to taste foods, to chew foods, etc. So what the young person wants isn't what the older person would often want. And then your awareness of food. Are you aware of the health benefits? Are you educated with regards to food? That's going to affect your choice. <coughs> And then an important bit that's being developed quite a lot lately is the genetic aspect to your food choice. And we will come back uh, to that in a, in a little while. So it's not just the family environment that you're growing up. It can be the genes from your parents that also influence the choice of food. But what we're going to focus on today are the sensory aspects of food. Because despite all of the things we've just mentioned there, ultimately, as you saw from the, the first few pictures there, if you don't like the look of the food, then you are not going to eat it. So the appearance of food is probably the most important thing deciding whether you'll eat or not. The smell of the food, the aroma of something baking in the oven, um, nice smells, if they come out, you're going to like it. The taste, and then texture is very important. Okay? We all want biscuits to have a nice, crisp, crunchy sound. You're not going to want them if they're soggy because you're going to think, well, that's gone off. So the sound, that things make in your mouth, particularly things like uh, breakfast cereals, like cornflakes, Special K, sound is very important in food products. 
So for all those elements that decide whether we like or not like food, most of it is governed by the chemistry of the food. So that's what we're going to take a look at now. So the first thing there is appearance. Say when we look at food and we don't like the look of it, that's it. We probably will walk away. You won't go any further. So starting with the appearance of food. Okay, the, just to mention as well, we're, in terms of what happens food, the foods do change as you go through processing, as you go through cooking. And we will take a look at how the constituents of foods change uh, until you get to the, the kitchen and cook it. But I say the key thing is the appearance of food. And this is why we have so many coloured stuff out here today, that the colour of food is very important in determining our food choice and our food preferences. And there you'll see just lots of uh, foods, pr primarily in their natural states. You have the bright red strawberries, largely coming from pigments called anthocyanins. You have the bright orange carrots coming from beta carotenes. And in general, fruit and veg tends to be very bright, tends to have nice colors and very uh, attractive. Things you might know where all of the colors in food come from, and this is considered a natural color. And it is, we'll see in a moment, it's quite hard to get a bright natural red color. And some of the colors uh, in food, like red colors in this case, they come from the dried body of an insect. So you take the female insect, you dry it, you grind it down, and that gives you red color that you've probably eaten quite a lot in things like yogurts and soft drinks. Um, so often just because something is called natural, it really isn't that natural to take the body of an insect and put it into food, but um, that's it with some of the food colors. One of the most expensive colors is saffron. So that gives nice orange colors and yellow colors to things like rice dishes. And where that comes from is the, the stamen of a plant, the crocus sativus. And why it's so expensive is that you, go, you have to go and collect the little orange stamen from each plant. Okay, so it becomes a very expensive uh, color to use in uh, food products. An important color is blood. And you mightn't have thought about blood giving a lot of color to food products. Okay, in terms of the chemistry of blood, the main pigment is hemoglobin. Iron is in the center of the four heme groups. And it gives the nice colors to meats, okay? So you can see a nice piece of, of steak there. And then over um, on this side here, can you see it coming out the tube? That's essentially black pudding. Okay, so <laughs> it might put you off black pudding. But it's a blood sausage, so the blood is what's giving it the very dark brown color inside uh, this sausage. So blood does add a lot of uh, color to products, particularly the color of meats and the change in packages, and that's due to changes in the hemoglobin of the product. So there are the colors, and why do we add them to, to food? Some of them are present naturally in food, others we add. Okay, so particularly confectionery products like these Jelly Babies here. If you were just to have the other ingredients in these, then they would be white. There'd be no color in them. And if there wasn't any color in them, then we have a lot of difficulties knowing what flavor they are. So if I was able to make all of these white and give them out to you, you'd struggle to tell me what flavor they are. Whereas if I give you a yellow one, you'll probably say it's lemon. If I give you a red one, you'll probably say it's strawberry. So color is, is very important uh, for foods that don't otherwise um, have any color. The other reason you add it is because you lose color when you're cooking products, and we'll see that in a moment. But most of all, uh, from a food processing point of view, is to get products looking the same, to have the same uniformity color is very important. Okay, the importance of color, I've just picked out a few examples. This is a Pepsi Cola that was launched in the 1990s, and it's clear. And it, can, it only lasted on the market for a few months because, because it's clear, you associate it with 7-Up. So nobody liked Pepsi that didn't have the dark brown color. Okay, so we only associate products with color, and often that intends to influence our choice as well. Heinz launched a green ketchup, and that failed miserably as well, because in people's head, ketchup is supposed to be red. It's not supposed to be green. So that didn't work. 
And then there's a, a Kellogg's um, cereal launched in the States that when you put the cereal into milk, the milk went blue. But people didn't want blue milk, okay, because milk is supposed to be white. So if things, if foods aren't the colour you expect it, generally you won't like it. So it does play a very big role in deciding whether you'll eat something or whether you don't.